welcome you to our Fresh Fiction Virtual Book Club, Lauren. It's so good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I am so delighted to be here. I have been deep in the writing cave, so it is so exciting to see actual live human faces instead of you know, dead imaginary historical people. Well, we're happy to give you that break then, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start off with an easy question, or uh, hopefully it's an easy question. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got started writing. Oh my goodness. Well, this is, I am that annoying person who decided when I was six years old that I was going to be a writer when I grew up. And I announced it to the entire first grade class of my very tiny all girl school. So, you know, once that announcement had been made, I just clearly could not walk it back. I mean, it was partially because my other two options at the time were princess or ballerina. And I can't dance and no one offered me a small European country. So I figured, okay, it'll be that writer thing. And then once you've identified yourself as the writer, you kind of have to keep it up. Good but, point, yes. So yeah, I spent my, my teenage years, other girls were going to tennis camp. I went to writer's camp um, and I wrote my, well, I wrote my first book while I was in fourth grade. It got rejected by Simon Schuster, who still to this day has not published me. And I finally, you know, I, I had this cunning idea that I was going to go to grad school so I could write um, grand historical epics, you know, those sort of thousand page long doorstop novels. But while I was avoiding working on my dissertation, for fun, I decided to write a Napoleonic romp, a spoof, um, a sort of mashup of Georgia Heyer and Julia Quinn and the Scarlet Pimpernel. And a friend gave it to a friend who gave it to an agent and suddenly that book was published. And so I spent 14 years writing Napoleonic spies. And this is something that just amazes me because I know I mean, there's so much effort when you're putting together your dissertation, but writing the first three books of the Pink Carnation series one a year through law school. I mean, how did you manage all of that? Well, I call it my theory of productive procrastination. If you're avoiding one thing, you'll be very productive on another. So actually, it worked really well for me because what had happened, the backstory here is I had decided, actually, I really didn't love teaching undergrads. And, you know, I wasn't sure I was cut out for an, a career in academia. So I lobbed in one application to law school because the law school was down the block from the grad school and I got in. Um, at that point, the manuscript for Pink Carnation was floating around, but I had no idea it was ever going to be published. It was just for fun. And then the month before I started law school, I got a call from some random guy who said, hi, I'm an agent and I want to represent you. And I thought it was a joke. I spilled coffee all over myself. I'm like, who is this? Who put you up to this? And it turned out he was actually a real bona fide agent. And so I started Harvard Law with the book being shopped and my first month I wound up with a two book contract at Penguin and I was not going to say no because that was everything I'd ever wanted on the other hand I would bought my books already I paid my tuition I'd started law school so I had to see that through but I found it worked so well because I wrote the book while avoiding doing my contracts reading and I did my contracts reading while avoiding doing my writing the book and so I just trade off with whatever I wanted to do least at the moment um it actually bizarrely it made law school a lot easier wow golly so you did practice law though for a time after you finished school right I start. I practiced as a litigator at a large New York law firm for a grand total of a year and a half. I made it to the lofty heights of second year associate. Um, it was not quite as easy to juggle that as it had been to juggle school and publishing. Um, because so, but my third book, The Deception of the Emerald Ring, came out my first week at Cravath. And I was like, so I'll go on tour over the weekend. And while I was on the train up to Boston, my Blackberry started going wild. And there are all these messages, come back to the office. We need you for this. I'm like, but I'm doing a book talk at seven at the Harvard Coop. And that was not considered a good excuse. I got away with it because it was the first week and they thought it was kind of adorable that I wrote books. Um, they like to trot me out to summer associates to be like, look, we have an associate who's an author, but it was made clear that was not really going to fly. And this was the old days. I mean, this was publishing before 
the seat, the winds changed when publishers sent you on these crazy tours where you're like, okay, you flew me to California and four people came. How did this make sense? And they're like, oh, no, it's great. This does not happen anymore and has not for a while, but this was the old days. So it became very clear that it was going to come down to, I could practice law or I could tour and write books. And so strangely enough, I picked the writing book side of things. Well, and obviously with that being such a long time love of yours, writing stories, and, and you've been so successful with, you know, just a few books published. Um, but do you ever look back and regret? Because I mean, going through law school is a big investment as far as time and effort and everything. You know, every now and then I do regret not having continued practicing. I have kept my bar association membership up, but I had had this sort of vague plan when I left the law to write full time back in, isn't this horrifying, 2008, that I was going to do pro bono work to keep my skills up. And then, of course, there's always something else. There's always a book that's behind deadline or the book you're supposed to blurb. Or, you know, lots of TV shows you need to watch clearly for, you know, research. And so I just never got around to doing that pro bono work. And every now and then I step back and I think, hmm, it would be nice to have an actual practical skill. Maybe I should go back and do law again. And then I wind up behind deadline, another book, and it never happens. But yeah, so I do every now and then feel that little bit of regret that I didn't keep up the law side of things. Well, your initial degrees were also in history which obviously writing and focusing on historical fiction, how much of what you studied in school makes it now into your stories? Or do you just figure it, hey, it's all history, so it's all fair game, well, and the research skills that you learned at that time play into it? It's absolutely about the research skills, because ironically, I have never written the book I keep intending to write about my own historical area of expertise because my field was Tudor Stuart England, and my specific specialty was the English Civil War, specifically royalist conspiracies during the latter half of the English Civil War, because I know everyone knows all about and is fascinated by the English Civil War. And whenever I want to scare my agent, I tell her, okay, it's time. I'm finally going to write my giant English Civil War epic. And she's like, you're joking, right? There was a period about three years ago when she was like, yeah, maybe it's the moment. Maybe it's time for the English Civil War epic. And I spent about six months sort of reacquainting myself with all of that material. And then she's like, actually, no, no one cares about the English Civil War. Don't do it. And I wrote a book called Band of Sisters set during World War I instead. But so ironically, I have never, you know, I've never used my actual scholarly area of expertise, but what I have found very useful were the research skills I learned. My advisor, one of the first things he told me was make friends with librarians because you will need them. And I have a very good librarian friend who's been my guardian angel throughout all these books and particularly Two Wars and a Wedding. Um, and the other thing was, I have a lot of former colleagues who have been really marvelous as I've hopped around places and time periods where, you know, one guy who was a friend from grad school was an early Americanist. And right now I'm working on a book about Hamilton. And I had some random questions about things. And so I emailed him. I was like, hey, can you tell me about this? And he's like, well, I can't. But here's this other guy I know who can. And so that's been really, it's been really helpful to have that network of historians who I can call and say, so you're working on the Caribbean now. I'm writing a book set in colonial Barbados. Tell me what I need to know and who I need to talk to. Of course, it also helped that I ran the history department social club. Um, so I have all these embarrassing pictures of people. I mean, this is pre-Facebook. So blackmail is always good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of, you know, a lot of good blackmail material on old fashioned, you know, those snapshots used to take on those disposable cameras and then print out at the photo store. <laughs> really old school. Well, how do you determine really what time period you want to focus on? Because you also do dual timelines and you've hit a variety of different time periods. Is it what the market interest is? Is it that you have an initial idea? Is it your story idea? Is it that you're interested in a period? How do you make that decision? 
It varies book by book, to be honest. I mean, sometimes it's I hear something and I can't get it out of my head or I stumble upon a random historical fact. I'm like, wait, that couldn't have happened. Um, the current the book I'm working on right now is about a true crime, uh, the Manhattan Well murder, where a young woman was found strangled in a well in Manhattan in January 1800. And a guy who lived at her cousin's boarding house was accused of her murder. And the guy's older brother hired as his defense team a guy named Brockholz Livingston, who no one knows about, and Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, the three of them working together for the defense right before the disputed elections of 1800, like a month before, where Burr and Hamilton tear each other to shreds. And so I was like, what? This can't be real. But it was. And so I'm writing a book about it. Um, there were other times, though, for example, Band of Sisters um, was partially because I found one of these crazy facts where I was like, oh, my God, there was a group of Smithies on the front lines of World War I. I have to write about this. But the reason I wrote about it when I wrote about it, instead of it going in my ideas folder and staying there, was because I had been told I could not write the English Civil War epic and I needed to write something set in the 20th century. So that was the synergy of I had found this amazing historical fun fact that needed to be investigated and I had been told I needed to write a 20th, 20th century book. So these things sort of dovetail. The one thing I put my foot down on is except for the Team W books that I co-write with Beatrice Williams and Karen White, um, I will not write World War II. I know that's the thing right now, but I really, really, really hate World War II. And I will not touch it with a 10-foot pole, which honestly, given the current market, is very hard because there was one point where I was you know, I had left my old publishing house and we were shopping me around and a bunch of people were like, come to us and write World War II. I'm like, no. But that's the thing that I always love about your books is that there's always something different, right? I, I love the Pink Carnation series because oh, I was fascinated with the Scarlet Pimpernel and, and that was the initial draw to me. I'm like, okay, how is all of this working? And then of course, with the current book, Two Wars and a Wedding, I admit I am not as familiar with the, the Greeks and Turks and, and that particular portion of the story, but it pulled me in also with Cuba and the Spanish American work because I loved reading about Clara Barton when I was growing up. So I'm like, oh my gosh, th okay, this is my jam right here. But those aren't common stories that you're finding nowadays. So the fact that you're able to pull in these true to life stories and epics and it puts a different spin on everything. And it's different from what you're seeing with the rest of the market. That's something I really enjoy. Well, I grew up on, you know, I was a child of the 80s. And I don't know if anyone else remembers, but there were those what they called the dumps at the front of the bookstore, those cardboard racks of books that would be filled with historical epics. And they were set all over the place. And I still have a lot of these old with the cracked spines because they were big fat mass markets. And I love that they were set all over. There was one set during the Lisbon earthquake of 1748 and one set in Renaissance Rome about a female artist named Chiara. Chiara? I don't speak Italian. But anyway, you know what I mean. And I've looked and looked for that book. I can't find it anywhere. And, you know, and so on. You know, I could go on and on, but I adored those books set all over the world in all sorts of historical places, events, people. And what I really particularly loved was learning without trying to learn. Exactly. Yes. And you felt like you were living in these places with these people. And so that's something I have really wanted to recreate with my books, that feeling of getting to go someplace totally different and new and random and learn about new places and people. I always love that part of it too. And I would throw out these random facts in school. So whatever topic we were studying, it was like, oh, and here's this additional random thing. And it was no matter what time period. And people were like, how do you know that? Because we didn't cover it in class. I'm like, well, you see, I read. And so you are so <laughs> my people. I remember on the European history AP quoting Judith Merkel Riley's um, A Vision of Light because that was set during the Black Death of 1348. I'm sure the person thought it was like some scholarly authority. Um, and, you know, in, when we were learning about the um, slave trade in middle school, I brought in MMK's Tradewind 
which has some really harrowing descriptions. And the teacher read it aloud to the class. I was so excited. But yeah, exactly that. Because these historical characters start to feel like friends, like you know them, like they're people you gossip about. Yes. And these times and places feel so real to you. And especially being able to recite the English royalty. Oh, because yeah. Again, at that time, I was reading everything English related. So I was reading the medieval, the Tudors, all the Regency. So I could just recite the kings and queens. And they're like, how do you know that? I'm like, yes, these are my romance books. This is how I know this. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I never understood people who thought history was boring or dry because to me, it was all gossip and scandal. It was like, Henry. oh my God, Henry II is cheating on Eleanor of Aquitaine again? Definitely. I mean, things that you just weren't seeing in other books and material. It's like, okay, this is fascinating. It kept my interest. And that's, I think, is also what's constantly drawing me back to these types of books, right? It's those little love, facts and that you get immersed in the time period. And what I loved about the books of that particular era was I feel like the borderline between romance and historical fiction was more fluid. That a lot of the romances I was reading, like Iris Johansson's Wind Dancer series, they are absolutely in the, the you know, genre of romance, but they also were so rich in historical detail and set in really random time periods. Like that particular series was Italian Renaissance, French Revolution, present day. And there were books like MMK's Tradewind, for example, that had a romance cover, but was very much historical fiction. And I feel like we've sort of made the borderlines harder, unfortunately. I think some of that may have had to do with the advent of trade paperbacks, where the genre is divided. I've always tried to keep those lines more fluid in my own books, because I feel like romance and historical fiction, historical fiction, historical romance, they're really two parts of the same thing. Mm -hmm. One of the other things, I mentioned it before, how you do deal with the dual timelines. How do you keep all of your different strings straight in your stories? Um, it is, you know, it's like they say when you're ice skating, you shouldn't look at your feet or you'll fall down. A lot of it is pure intuition and instinct. Um, I write, it's funny because my good friend Beatrice Williams, she writes her timeline separately. She'll write one time period and then she'll write the next period and then she weaves them together. And she says she writes faster that way. And I tried to do it with one book. I crashed and burned after about two chapters and went back to, I read those books exact. I sorry, I write those books exactly as you read them piece by piece, because in sort of the writing parlance, I am a pantser. Um, I tend to figure out who my characters are and what they're doing as I go along. And when I'm writing dual timeline books, I'm figuring out both timelines as I go along. I generally have a vague idea of what the core historical story is about. Um, that sort of, I view the earlier timeline is usually my anchor because that's what sets the tone for the second timeline, which is often more reactive. Um, but both have to react to each other in various ways and interweave with each other. And the only way I can do that is by figuring out as I go along. It's like a weird sort of intuitive magic. I'm always terrified that, you know, my, my subconscious will abandon me and stop, you know, working. Well, we touched on them, but what is your writing process when you're teaming up with Beatrice and Kate? Because again, those are different types of books. And as you just said, you have different styles. So how do you guys connect with that and put those stories together? Well, I think what drew us together in the first place is that we're all very character-driven writers. And so that was something we had in common is that we, we all talk about our characters as if they're real people we were meeting at a cocktail party and getting them drunk to find out their secrets. Um, and we also said so we sort of figure things out as we go along. And we also are all really fascinated by the way the past and the present interweave, by the way the past affects our lives, even when we don't know it does. That things our parents or grandparents or great great grandparents did have had these impacts on our lives. And we inherit these stories, half of which are untrue. And you have to sort of sort out who you are based on um flawed evidence so that's something we all found very you know that's that drives all of our writing is how do the past and present interweave and what do you, how are perceptions of character um shaped by the stories people tell about themselves and the stories families tell about themselves 
And so we had this idea. We knew we wanted to write together. We had a very noble motive. We wanted our publisher to pay for our girls' trip and our bar bill. No, seriously, this was our goal. And so we were like, we should write a book together. We were a little drunk at the time. And we decided, you know what? We all write dual timeline novels. Why not triple timeline? And we'll set it around a house in New York because that provides a really good locus to tie the stories together. Three women, three different time periods. And so we we had no idea if this would work. Um, we had, none of us had ever written with anyone else before. None of us had ever thought of writing with anyone else before. We're all very you know, protective of our process, but we really wanted that barbell paid. It was huge. So we, so Karen and Beatrice came into New York. I had a six month old at the time. So they came to me and we met up at a tea shop near my house, this place, Alice's Teacup. And we started throwing around ideas and a magic happened. We realized we were building on each other's ideas. Um, and the story was sort of growing organically as we were talking. And before we knew it, we had an outline and none of us outline on our own. So we, what we did was we outlined that whole book together and then we wrote it round Robin. So it's written exactly as people read it. And each of us was reading the other's chapters before we would write our own, even though we were writing in different timelines. So you're always reacting to the things the other two have written before you. You're picking up themes, you're picking up voice. Um, and that was the crazy thing. We all have really distinct voices and we all write in very separate sort of fields. I, at the time, was writing only English things. Karen was writing Southern things and Beatrice was writing New England things. And we've all sort of diversified since then. But at the time, we really had our lanes um, and we thought we really obvious the second someone opened that manuscript, who had written what? And then we wound up, so long story, everyone thought this was a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Our agents didn't want us to do it. Our editors didn't want us to do it. But we held firm because Barbell. And finally, Karen's editor, as a pity buy, offered to buy it mostly to keep Karen happy because she loves Karen. And she gets a manuscript and she's like, oh my God, this is really good. And we're like, you're surprised. And then she sent the wrong edits to the wrong authors. And we were like, you're joking, right? Because we have really different voices. But it turned out our voices had changed and melded as we were writing. And my theory is we're all choral singers or all have been at some point choral singers. You blend voices. You do it automatically without thinking. And so when we're writing Team W, we blend. And we now have this thing where our editor, when she sends the notes, sends her guesses. And actually, she writes this beautiful essay, like a multi-part essay explaining why she thought who wrote what. And she has gotten it right. So we've written for, gosh. So this is our, we moved books after, we moved, sorry, my brain's gone. We moved publishing houses after that first book. So we've now had four books with our second editor. And I think she's gone who wrote what right once. That's awesome. And you guys are planning on continuing that, right? I mean, you've done four books, right? Yes. Actually, I'm trying to think is. Or maybe four published? Wait, no. Five? Is it five? I've lost track. Anyway, yeah, maybe. Well, okay. But we've got one that's sitting up on our computers right now waiting for us to edit um, because it's gone to our editor. She came back with the edits. And once again, she guessed wrong as to who wrote which character. And we are so pleased. Um, but that book, it's, well, our working title may not happen. I can't tell it to you because it's top secret. Um, but that book is due out in autumn of 2024. Okay. Yes. And well, it, let us and switch over. Gone. Scott. Oh, well, we always love Scottish books. Come on. Definitely. But we've kept on talking. And so but I do want to get some of our fresh fiction facts with you. Um, so these are meant to be short, quick type questions off the top of your head on a variety of topics. Hopefully nothing that's going to stump you too hard, though. OK, <laughs> as long as there's no math or science involved. No, no, okay. no, we don't do the math. That's okay. okay. Don't worry. Yeah, I've, I've had to do my, my daughter's summer math packet with her. I'm like, you're a third grader. This should not be hard for me. And yet it is. It's the new math. that That's the problem. If it was regular math. It would be okay. <laughs> I know. I'm saying they're carrying numbers and she's like, mom, we don't do that anymore. We do number lines. I'm like, no. Just do basic math, please. <laughs> okay. Who would you most want to be stuck in an elevator with? Dorothy Parker. 
Ooh, I like that answer. Okay. Um, what is something that you own an absolute, absolutely ridiculous amount of? Nespresso pods. Ooh. What is a purely luxury item that you consider to be an absolute necessity? Starbucks while I'm working. <laughs> and is Starbucks coffee your main writing fuel? It's actually, it's less about the coffee. I view it as table rent because I find I have to get out and away from my apartment, partially because my children live in my apartment. I have to get out away from my apartment to really work effectively. And so that's, you know, that cup next to me, it's partially fuel, but it's also, it's how I secure my table. I actually, a very nice homeless man at the next table yesterday told me he really admired my focus. Wow. And I love that you can meet so many different random people when yeah. you're at something like that and you're spending so much time there and just observing the people in and out of the shop usually. Well, and I feel like this is something I lost during the pandemic because, you know, New York closed down hard. Um, but pre-pandemic, I knew everyone in my Starbucks, like one of the baristas had a kid the same age as mine. So we would exchange children's books and stuff and they would come over and be like, how's the book going? Do you need an extra caramel macchiato? And it was amazing. I haven't really, I've only just started going back to Starbucks again because my my local Starbucks was closed for a while. Then they took out all the tables so no one would sit there. And now the tables are finally back. So we're back to that. But it's it's exactly what you were saying. It makes such a difference having that sort of, it's a weird sort of office community. You build these sort of Starbucks office relationships. <laughs> Who was actually your first book boyfriend or, or girlfriend? Oh my goodness. Okay. You know what? That one. So, okay. I do know it's and why can't I remember his last name? This is one of those obscure historical fictions of the 80s. It was a book called Anne of Cambrai by Mary Lyde about a Welsh heiress who has this Norman French guardian during um, the wars between Stephen and Matilda. And so, of course, her family, she, they're on the Stephen side but he loses and anyway, Henry II gets involved. It's a long story, but there's this very um, compelling Norman French guardian who of course falls in love with his rebellious ward. And his name is Raoul, but I don't, I think it's like Raoul de Sedgwick or something like that. It's one of those eighties medieval romance names, but he was wonderful because there was a conflict of he had to marry for duty and yet he is in love with his ward. And then the wars happen and all sorts of stuff. But anyway, but so I'm all the detail right. that you're giving me on this. I mean, it's obvious <laughs> it was like such an yeah, impact for you. The crazy thing is, I think, you know, I have not read that book for a couple of decades. I could still quote lines to you from it. <laughs> Actually, I had a thing for book boyfriends named Raul. My other big book boyfriend was Raul de Valmy from, um, gosh, Mary Stewart's Nine Coaches Waiting, which I think is sort of the fundamental Gothic novel. For always wanting to be a writer, is there a particular story or book world that you wish that you could have jumped in on? Oh my goodness, so many. Um, because there are always those books. Are, well, there's always that push and pull between reading a series and being like, I'm so glad someone wrote this and reading a series and being like, wait, why didn't I write this? So recently, I finally just got in late on the game and started um, Lee Bardugo's and now I'm going to blank out on the name, but the Shadow and Bone. So I read the first Shadow and Bone book and was like, oh my gosh, why didn't I think about this? This is fabulous. Um, I also just read The Wishing Game, which I also adored and had a similar reaction to the, oh my God, what an amazing concept and execution. The idea of sort of children's book fantasies brought to life, but with a core romance. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, I'm so glad it exists, but I also wish I'd written it. What is your most dog-eared copy of a book? And is it a fiction read or is it a nonfiction research? Oh, absolutely fiction. Um, maybe Ella Montgomery's The Blue Castle, which is one of her non-Anne books, but I, it's, her, it's one of her few standalones. I have always adored it. Wow. Okay, you've been kidnapped, but they return you two hours later because you will not stop talking about what? Right now, the Manhattan Well murder. 
I mean, like I'll be on the bus to school with my five-year-old um, who's just finished preschool and he'll be like, tell me more about the murder mom. Who do you think did it? I'm like, well, you know, they were debating over whether or not she was drowned or strangled and drowned. And he's like, well, I have a theory. And I'm like, okay, what am I doing to my five-year-old? But yeah. <laughs> and then is that spurring various looks with people around you as here you're talking about the details of different murders with your five-year-old? Oh, absolutely. You yeah. should see some of those looks we got on the bus where I'm like, well, and then the medical testimony was. <laughs> okay, the most important question and to wrap things up, what is the best way for our readers to keep up with you and find out what's coming next? You can find me on my website. I have an interactive news page, which was sort of my answer to a blog back when, because I didn't want a blog, but I did want to keep you know, sort of posting things semi-regularly. So I do try to post on that at least once a week. I have something called Weekly Reading Roundup, where I post what I'm reading and people chime in. I'm also, you can also find me fairly frequently on Instagram at, at Lauren Willig and on Facebook at, at Lauren Willig. I'm technically on Twitter, but I open it about once a month to see if anyone's mentioned me and then close it again. So that doesn't really count. But right now I've been in the writing cave, so I have not been terribly interactive anywhere and I've fallen behind on weekly reading roundup. But when I am not deep in, oh crap, I'm a month behind deadline, you can usually find me on Facebook and Instagram. And I'm kind of scared to ask since you are deep in the writing cave, when is the next book due? Because well, you know, we're actually, always interested in what's coming next. Well, this book, it actually, it got pushed way back, not because of my malingering, I'd like to add, but because of um, supply chain issues where apparently it's taking them longer and longer to print books. So this book was supposed to be coming out next spring and it had a June deadline. And my editor called me and was like, well, actually, even if you turn it in on deadline in June, there's no way we're gonna have this ready to go in March. So why don't we push it back to January, 2025? And I was like, okay, sure. Well, because part of the issue is, because I also have the Team W books, there's always a very careful maneuvering around, they don't want our individual books to come out at the same time as the Team W books. So, and we've got a book coming out that autumn. So that meant this book couldn't come out till winter. So that's why it got pushed back so far. Okay. Anyway, so my Hamilton book will be out January, 2025. And the next Team W book will be out autumn, probably September, we think, 2024. Awesome. Well, Lauren, I feel like we just barely scratched the surface and even though we talked about so many different things. So thank you again for joining us tonight, but stick around for our after hours happy hour with our other readers for some more Q&A. Oh, thank you so much. This was so much fun. 